Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven F1 with Patrick Hansen, Gana Pagrebna. Hello, Gana. Hello, all. Hi. So today Hi. we have uh, uh, an exciting topic that uh, uh, we were told we missed by one of our viewers. Right? Exactly. Uh, uh, and it was uh, Stefan Asakriti. I hope uh, I spelled the uh, name correctly who suggested that would be an interesting topic. And as we always mention in our episode, if you have any comments, let, let us know. Also, if you have any suggestions uh, for a topic, which we may have uh, overseen on our way from the 1950s uh, uh, to 2001. And in fact, we are right now in the middle of the 70s uh, also. Uh, let us know. And uh, as you see uh, on uh, at uh, today's uh, episode, um, uh, we may uh, take your ideas and put it into an episode. That's right. So today we are discussing the, the first ever sponsor, right? In, in, in Formula in, One. In Formula One, yes. Uh, and uh, credit racing, yeah. That we we uh, kind of, I think the comment came um, um, as a result of our discussion around uh, liveries, right? And when we were saying yes, that um, kind of we, we, we we paid attention to them, but we didn't uh, um, actually discuss uh, sponsorships when the sponsorships originated. And yeah, so there you go. The first ever sponsor in Formula One, Yemen Credit Racing. Yep, small British team with some quite interesting um, points, which we will see uh, today, hopefully. Yeah, we just need to maybe make a... a, a, a so the footnote here that uh, previously, as we explained in, in 1950s, 1960s, uh, all the way until about 1968, uh, the teams, uh, well, the teams were not the usual teams like we know them today. And essentially constructors uh, raced uh, under their uh, uh, factory names, right? For example, Maserati or Alfa Romeo or Ferrari. Um, but, um, uh, currently, as you know, the teams normally have the sponsor's name in them. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Yemen Credit was the, the first sponsor of a racing team and they had this, a racing team named after them. Uh, so this is why we are calling this the first ever sponsor in Formula One. Yeah, that's uh, and correct. And uh, indifferent um, to uh, today and maybe also uh, later, starting uh, end of the 60s, uh, um, we have the name of the sponsor as um, part of the uh, as the name of the team. And uh, we will see this practically. We are speaking about two different uh, teams here. But we what we not have uh, today is uh, the uh, the sponsor as a logo on directly on the car. The cars had been painted uh, um, related to the Yeoman uh, uh, credit um, company. Uh, and this is, uh, and with this, we are going slowly away from what we saw in the beginning um, that the cars had been painted to, uh, to their country. So, uh, I mean, it's also logic, a logical step as we had a, a number of, uh, of, of I'm sorry, British teams. And if they all have been in the same uh, green, uh, I mean, nobody could uh, distinguish them. So they already, uh, even without sponsoring, they have uh, gone away slowly from this idea to have the same color. And uh, of course, this uh, supported now uh, corporates uh, and maybe motivating teams painting the cars based uh, on their sponsorship. As And here, Yeoman Credit was the first one. Yes, exactly. And uh, uh, as we explained before, the uh, sort of delivery type of sponsorships appeared uh, much later in 1960s, but this uh, team appeared in early 1960s. And uh, this was, uh, well, we also need to, to say that this was not the first time the companies used uh, racing to advertise. For example, yeah, yeah. with Patrick, we, we discussed uh, in detail American races where this kind of the, the primary goal is to advertise your company. Oh, it used to be, sorry, yeah, no, probably not anymore, but uh, it, it used to be the case. Uh, so um, it, it, it's not like there were no sponsors before Yemen Credit Racing, but uh, it, it, this was the first time 
uh, a company organized the racing team in Formula One. Uh, exactly. was the main sponsor and also had named uh, the racing team after after itself. And yeah, so we also know, we also have, uh, have to make a d distinction between, I guess, Ferrari, right? Ferrari also is a brand and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the car. Uh, and um, yeah, but, but uh, this, this was the first sponsor that didn't have anything to do with motor racing. So this was a, yep. <laughs> a financial company. So this is what we mean by the first sponsor. Mm -hmm. Uh, exactly. And when we're speaking about human uh, credit racing, there are two teams. Uh, they have been active three years in uh, Formula One. The first time they, uh, let's say, they supported with their sponsoring to build up the British racing partnership, small British team. And the first year uh, they raced as uh, officially as the human credit uh, racing team. Uh, after this, after Yeoman uh, switched to Rec Panel Racing, uh, British Racing Partnership stayed around for some uh, years more uh, as British Racing Partnership. Uh, no, sorry, not as a British Racing. They, uh, in fact, they uh, went to a competitor from Yeoman Racing as Yeoman uh, um, teamed up with uh, Rec Panel Racing, a team which already entered Formula One, um, I think, in 1959, if I'm correct. Yeah, late so, 1950s, uh, Rech Parnell definitely yeah, was, was already active. And I just want to say that uh, Rech Parnell, you probably uh, don't remember this team, but uh, they probably had the most, um, uh, originally, the most uh, uh, sort of patriotic colors in the sense that it was like Union Jack, right? The blue and red and, and white yeah. type of car. So again, quite different from the green, the, 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 the green the color traditional to British racing teams. Exactly. So when we speak about, and, and this is pretty much the same as today, uh, the, uh, the name of the sponsors, there has been like uh, the temporary name um, of the team as we see today and also, as we see, for example, also in um, uh, today in other sports, uh, for example, in football or soccer. Well, it, I, I think it's not uh, that the teams uh, change the names, but we see this today in the name of the stadiums, which are mostly now named after a big sponsor. That's right. So in the f yeah. And as you can see, this is the, the, the British beef eater for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, on the credit, uh, on, the, on the Yemen credit racing team uh, logo. Uh, so quite a, uh, quite a cool logo, very unusual, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> but probably quite, uh, quite similar to things that we saw in 1950s, 1960s. Yeah. Exactly. So, the, so first of all, of course, we want to check out uh, who is human uh, credit as for various years now, this company is not uh, existing anymore. Even its successor is not existing anymore. But uh, who was this company? Uh, it was founded uh, by uh, Joseph Samengo Turner in the mid 1950s. By 59, 60, so shortly before the company became uh, active, it was run by Joseph's son. Paul, William, and uh, Fabian, his brother, and with an expanding business in financing retail motor sales. So it was a bank, but somehow also related um, to cars. Uh, so it was somehow, let's say, um, in, in the business. Um, the two Samengo uh, Turner brothers were looking for new ways of advertising uh, human credit. And this uh, led to a meeting with Ken Gregory, of the British Racing Partnership, uh, which resulted in the formation of the first fully sponsored Formula One Grand Prix team, giving Yeoman Credit the opportunity to secure profile advertising in press and uh, television. Uh, interesting for them as somehow they have been related to the uh, car industry. So it uh, made the sense. Yeah, that's right. So they, uh, they were in financial services and yes, indeed they uh, offered um, a broad range of, of financial services and of course uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the advertisement was uh, one of the main uh, ideas for this team. Uh, however, also I believe uh, the Samanga Turner brothers were enthusiastic. We will see later a photo of them 
the uh, yeah. motor enthusiasts and they themselves have you know driven <laughs> nice cars and generally were interested in this so i think the interest also came from personal passion here not just from uh, the business uh, incentive but uh, the whole um, the whole point of kind of innovating in in this domain uh, so uh, using uh, racing as a as a a business innovation tool as advertising tool marketing tool um, is something that we definitely should credit the manga turner family um, and as we will see later in the in the history of formula one uh, many different teams uh, have adopted this model and uh, we had many different uh, sponsorships in uh, formula one and we continue to have the sponsorship to date yep Let's have a look on their first uh, ever uh, season. So initially the team entered uh, Formula 2 and occasional uh, Formula 1 uh, races, which was uh, nothing uncommon uh, in the early 1960s, where Formula 2, it wasn't, let's say, as today, a one-way uh, development where the young drivers went Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. Uh, but uh, many times even uh, the big uh, stars of Formula 1 they participated in between the race weekends in uh, Formula 2 races. So this was, uh, again, quite uh, common in the 1960s. Um, but let's say after they, they started Formula 2, Formula 1, occasionally in 1960, they made the step to concentrate uh, on a three-car Formula 1 team uh, running uh, 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 the Copa T51, uh, the version from the last year. Um, success was a little bit mixed. It wasn't too successful. And uh, as we remember, uh, racing sport is, was very dangerous in that time. Unfortunately, um, two of their drivers, uh, Harry Shell and Chris Bristol, have been killed uh, driving these cars in the various uh, events. One was inside a Formula One race and the other one, uh, I think Formula Two, if I'm uh, correct. Yeah, I also wanted to say that uh... Uh, you know the, the fact that we this this team appeared was in a sense uh, of course a novelty but on the other hand this was not a, 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 a huge surprise because uh, the, the sort of the barriers to entry into Formula One were much lower and uh, uh, Patrick and I were discussed kind of originally in kind of 19, 19, 1950s right when uh, the sport only just started there were also individuals who could just buy cars and race uh, uh, race them so 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 called uh, uh, the era of gentleman drivers right that that yeah. we had and uh, uh, in a sense uh, this was the logical continuation of that tradition except yeah the the, um, uh, the this particular team was also um, used for marketing purposes and to showcase the brand yep interesting uh, um, uh, the various drivers uh, who drove uh, for the team uh, because there are some pretty uh, quite uh, well-known uh, names as you see on our slide if you are uh, watching here on uh, YouTube. Um, important, especially the bigger names, they not uh, drove the whole season. Uh, for example, um, first one, uh, Phil Hill, who became later Formula One champion from 90, uh, 1961. Also in 1960, he was already the driver for the Scuderia Ferrari. So why uh, Phil had the opportunity to drive in the season uh, with the Yeoman team and not with the Scuderia Ferrari? Uh, easy. Uh, at that time, um, uh, I mean, we have been, the, the uh, situation, have, the financial situation of the various teams have been uh, completely uh, different than today. So even a big name as uh, Ferrari, they don't. They only had a very limited uh, budget. Uh, so due to this, they concentrated uh, on the races in uh, Europe and not went uh, to the overseas race in the US, especially if the season was already decide decided, uh, meaning um, that Phil Hill didn't have the opportunity to become champion or the Scuderi together with the uh, Scuderia or that the championship was already uh, decided, for example. So 
Phil Hill, uh, he got the opportunity uh, from uh, Ferrari to look for a different uh, car for the US uh, Grand Prix at the end and uh, do And for whatever reason, uh, Yeoman race, Racing always seemed to have a good relation with Ferrari. So uh, Phil Hill got the opportunity to drive um, the Cooper in the US race at the end of uh, 1960. Uh, and uh, even uh, scored uh, uh, some points as he became fifth. So the cars hadn't been uh, relatively uh, competitive. Um, Uh, even against uh, the bigger names, um, of course, considering that not all of the bigger uh, teams had been starting in the US race. Um, similar uh, also with the other ones, Olivier Gendebin, uh, for many people, um, consider him as one of the greatest sports car racers of all time. So mostly he was yeah, focusing you can see on, him the on the sports on cars. The You can see him on the photo if you're watching us on YouTube. I just want to add, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's the guy. And uh, uh, he was focusing on sports car racing, but from time to time uh, he uh, took the opportunity to also drive uh, Formula One. And similar also uh, Tony Brooks, the racing dentist, uh, who was more related to the Vanderbilt uh, team. Yeah, and, and in that sense, uh, here we don't we we see the same tradition as in uh, as as we see now in a sense in in uh, Formula One, where smaller teams uh, are used as a, uh, as a kind of training uh, training field for younger talent or not not so so young talent. Uh, in case of 1960s, like we explained before, the drivers were older. But nevertheless, uh, people who were new to, to Formula One would start with smaller teams. And uh, this was one of the teams where you could start as a Formula One driver. Yes. And uh, I mean, and the, the, so as you mentioned, this could be younger talents, but in some cases uh, it was less the talent, but uh, more the money as or the same as today. Uh, we see that uh, some of the seats uh, had to go to paid drivers. Uh, which uh, contributed uh, to the general budget of the team and, of course, also to pay the number one driver, who was mostly the one uh, who started based on the talents. And something we discussed also in the uh, last uh, episode about uh, where we have been talking about 1976 is that... Uh, When we are speaking about 1970s, 1960s, be honest, uh, this is all, all this has uh, happened around uh, 60 years ago. So there you always find uh, different uh, channels telling you different uh, stories. So difficult to say what is true, what is not. So please also consider uh, this. Uh, but at least um, something uh, what... Uh, um, was directly said uh, as by the family member from, the, I don't forget who of the two brothers said it, uh, but uh, what he said is that Enzo Ferrari contacted uh, the uh, Samengo Turner family, offering them the opportunity to run a semi-works uh, Formula One team in the next season, including uh, the new Ferrari 1.5 liter engines, uh, which would uh, have made it, uh, sense Uh, because um, 1960 Ferrari was uh, uh, lacking competitivity because they still uh, competed uh, with cars having the engine uh, in front of the driver. And uh, due to this, it would have made sense to uh, combine having a second team uh, let run by people who already have uh, had um, experience with cars like the Cooper T51, which had the engine uh, behind it, because this was clearly the future of uh, Formula One. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Samenga, uh, Samengo uh, Turner family turned down uh, Ferrari's uh, offer, and this based on uh, Ferrari's uh, lacking experience with middle engine cars. I mean, this decision, again, uh, you could say, uh, is logical based on the information you had in 1960, Uh, with the information we had today, maybe uh, it was a big lost opportunity. As we remember, 1961, uh, Ferrari was uh, very competitive with their 
new mid-engine car, which you see um, on the right. And I think this is a, well, not, I, sorry, I don't think I'm completely sure this is a replica because there's no original um, uh, shark noses uh, existing, unfortunately. So this is a replica, which uh, you can see in some of the uh, retro uh, presentations, races. So, I mean, you could imagine how the history uh, could have uh, changed uh, for uh, human racing if they would uh, have deployed 1961 Ferrari and 156 shark noses. Yeah, and uh, well, that's um, also, we know that Phil Hill was spotted by Enzo Ferrari and, you know, was uh, obviously also a good um, advocate for for. Uh, for this team uh, in uh, in Ferrari, but uh, you know when when we consider uh, some of the Turner Turner brothers, we also know that they were very uh, pro sort of building British all around British teams. So probably there were not only uh, technical reasons yep. why they rejected, but also some uh, political reasons. Let's just say for not forming uh, collaboration with uh, an Italian team. At the time. This, uh, I think you have a point here. Uh, this could be a, let's say, a logical second reason why they may have uh, declined, declined this offer. Yeah, Surtis. Right, <laughs> Surtis. Yeah, yeah. So we've, uh, when we discussed John Surtis in great detail, I just want to rem remind uh, all of you that we have a special about John Surtis and. Uh, yeah, uh, believe it or not, he was also connected to this team, right? Right. So, uh, as we mentioned uh, already beginning, uh, right after the first season, the Yeoman uh, brothers, um, the Samengo Turner brothers, uh, they uh, um, oversaw their idea and they came to the conclusion that maybe it would be better to sponsor a team which was already a little bit more um, established. And they went uh, to Rec Panel Racing. Uh, they already had been founded 1951. And uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, on the next pages. Uh, Rec Panel uh, himself was a quite uh, well-known uh, driver. Um, the original team, BRP, they had to find a new uh, sponsor and a source of income. And they uh, ha had been successful. and. Uh, and made a contract with United uh, Dominions Trust, which have been a com direct competitor of Yeoman Credit, so quite interesting. Uh, so they also have been involved in the financing of uh, retail motor sales. And uh, nevertheless, uh, BIM not had been uh, such a sustainable team. So they only uh, stayed uh, in Formula One until 1964. Nevertheless, uh, they had been uh, still uh, good drivers, uh, uh, using these cars uh, as, for example, uh, Innes Ireland and Marston uh, Gregory. Um, you will see these names again. So um, they not only had been active uh, for uh, BRP, but also uh, for um, the new Yeoman team, or better said, uh, for the direct panel team after they lost the sponsorship from Yeoman. Yeah, and uh, if you think about it, you know, we, we had... Uh... Phil Hill racing for, racing for this team for human credit. Uh, we also had John Surtees, uh, uh, Reg Parnell, uh, obviously a legendary driver, even though not a Formula One champion, but nevertheless very uh, decorated guy as well. So uh, as you can see, a lot of talented people have uh, started uh, their careers here or even, you know, mm -hmm. kind of came from, uh, from uh, another type of racing into the sport through this team. So again, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the value of smaller teams, uh, you know, when, when it comes to training yeah. and finding talent in Formula One. Exactly. Um, um, uh, so uh, 1961, um, they had a good start, uh, especially with uh, John uh, Sotis, uh, who won uh, the Glover Trophy at the uh, Goodwood, which has been um, a race based on uh, similar to Formula One uh, regulations. Uh, nevertheless, it was a non-championship uh, race, so didn't count for the championship. That's right. 
And well, here's a red parnell as you can see. <laughs> Highly decorated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also have, I believe, some uh, bio note on him. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, ra he ran a private uh, team, right? Uh, private Formula One team, so kind of very similar to the gentleman-like teams uh, of, of the past. Uh, and had a, a, a collaboration with Yemen Credit, uh, which uh, provided a significant boost to Reg Parnell, obviously. You know, he was an enthusiast who kind of invested uh, into in the Formula One, and it's always good to have a sponsor. And uh, definitely, Yemen Credit came uh, uh, in in the right place at the right time here. Yep. And as uh, most uh, small uh, smaller teams, uh, they had their moments. Uh, for example, John Sotis, besides the success at the already mentioned uh, non-official race in the Dutch Grand Prix of 1962, uh, he could secure the pole position. Um, nevertheless, besides these moments, maybe also due to lacking a budget, uh, internal infrastructure, same as today, um, on the long run, the big results had been lacking uh, also uh, with this team. Again, Raj Parnell here, uh, and uh, as you can see, it's so a short note about him. Actually, when you, I think uh, when you look for information on Raj Parnell, you often see uh, the um, the plate uh, f f uh, from Derby, uh, where you know it says that here lived uh, Reg Parnell and all his <laughs> numerous uh, sort of uh, achievements in racing. So yeah, he wasn't uh, so uh, successful in Formula One, but generally he is a legendary figure in in uh, British racing and certainly influenced a lot of people. Um, uh, and uh, remembered by, by many British fans. Yeah, and uh, as you see, he started for um, a lot of uh, different teams uh, um, already uh, in the first year of Formula One. He had been, let's say, a guest uh, driver for the Alfa Romeo with the 158. Uh, later, uh, he drove for, for private teams, non-works Ferrari, also non-works uh, Maserati as non-works uh, Cooper and, of course, the BRM. Uh, on the photo, you, uh, you saw him in the uh, Maserati. That particular car, if I'm correct, uh, you can see today at the Donington Museum. So maybe you saw it as you have been uh, there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and uh, again, as, as usual, Patrick and I recommend that you, that you don't just listen to, to podcasts and watch videos, but actually go to museums and read some books on Formula exactly. One. And uh, there's definitely a lot of information on Rech Parnell. And if you are in Derby or Derbyshire, uh, that's a good, generally a great uh, place to, to learn about British racing. But uh, in particular, you can learn a lot about Rech Parnell. Exactly, because, um, and we will speak a little bit about it, uh, the career uh, of him, there had been also some serious uh, setbacks, so he wa it was also a little bit um, uh, un under discussion, uh, his uh, character, because, uh, and this is a particular uh, related um, to an accident uh, he had in 1933, because after this as, as far as I remember, this is one um, of the few uh, uh, situations where uh, after an accident, the stewards, organizers really identified that uh, the one party had been uh, culpable. Uh, uh, and uh, due to this, well, we have this sometimes that you're not allowed to drive, participate in the next race, that you are the next time you start some positions, uh, further down, but here he really lost his driving license for various years, um, meaning that he could not uh, develop uh, himself as a driver. Uh, and this may explain uh, why he not became more successful in uh, Formula One, only participated something like a guest driver, because uh, uh, the time where normally the young drivers develop uh, 
he wasn't uh, able to race because he didn't had a racing uh, license. Mm -hmm. um, what happened um, in the mentioned uh, race? He lost his license to, to a practice accident at the 500 miles race at uh, Brooklands, uh, UK. He, uh, what happened? He mis misjudged an overtaking move on uh, K. Petre. Uh, when he lost the uh, control of the MG, he crashed uh, into her, Austin 7, from behind, causing it to roll. She crashed badly and was uh, seriously injured. And as a uh, uh, consequence, she never raced competitively again. Also, she put the incident down as, let's say, bad uh, racing luck. The organizers uh, revoked Panel's, uh, Panel's racing license for two years, meaning two years uh, without opportunity to race, especially in, uh, in younger age where you are normal uh, to get this experience to grow and to uh, become a Formula One driver. Yeah, that's right. And that's also, uh, uh, we need to mention that uh, he uh, came from a family, like a um, family uh, that, that was directly related to motorsport mechanics in particular. So they, they, they had a garage business in Derby and uh, um, like uh, several British drivers that we have discussed, he enjoyed uh, family support throughout his experience in racing. Uh, even though there were different setbacks, like losing the license, but it's uh, it is important to feel the support of the family. And Rich Parnell yeah. was definitely the lucky guy who had that uh, support, and also he had the mechanical experience that he was getting at home. So even though yeah he couldn't race, but uh, you know the business didn't go away anywhere, so he still could do some work on on cars and. Uh, this was part of his, uh, yeah, part of the things that he did uh, as, a, as a part of this period without license. Yeah, uh, funny story uh, around uh, him. Um, the first car uh, he bought in 1935 had been a Bugatti racing car uh, and he got it for 25 pounds, even if the pounds in that year must have been much, much more than today. It was still quite cheap. Uh, for uh, if you think it it was for Bugatti, so uh, he thought a great uh, great deal. Uh, you can he, only uh, imagine how much the sky is worth now, especially considering that <laughs> Rich Pernell drove it as well. So <laughs> yeah, I, I mean the problem is uh, I think he he not really drove the car. Uh, the first uh, he took it uh, of course to the race, but uh, already uh, arriving at the paddock. It uh, broke down, and the uh, and the repairing it would have been too expensive. Uh, so uh, he never really drove it, and he replaced it uh, with an MG later on. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but you know, it would be nice to buy Bugatti for twenty five quid. So yes. definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> a dream. <laughs> even even this Bugatti never works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agreed. So, uh, so what did uh, young uh, the young uh, Rich? Um, yeah, he as he was a motorsport fan, he stayed uh, around, uh, uh, but he, unable to uh, race uh, himself. He started a business, uh, lending uh, his cars, with the the ones which he already acquired before that instance, and uh, the next two years also, and uh, rented them to people uh, uh, with money and they even um, uh, designed, uh, well not designed, but uh, they uh, created, uh, crafted um, a Formula 2 car based on existing technology, uh, which they called the Panel Challenger. Nice uh, silver car, but untypical color for a British car. Uh, I mean, silver, this looks like a silver arrow, a Mercedes, but is the Panel Challenger, which is still existing today. Yeah, I just uh, probably had to do with the paint job, probably that he maybe couldn't afford, or you know, considering <laughs> that he was put, um, putting it together himself. Uh, yeah, so it could be some, you know, quite trivial reasons for this. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, also kind of uh, again, just to remind you that he did it pre-war, and obviously the Second World War interfered with his racing plans and. Uh, 
yeah, the, again, uh, there was another setback in in training and achieving uh, racing results because of the war. Yep. So here we see, if you're uh, with us on YouTube, uh, a little bit the technology, uh, the cars. He drove uh, 1950 Formula 1's very first um, season. He had been uh, the opportunity to drive the Alfa Romeo 158, the car which later uh, won the championship uh, together with uh, Nino Farina. Nino Farina. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1951, uh, he drove the famous uh, Ferrari 375 uh, Sinwall, a very nice car, practically a uh, Ferrari 375, which have been uh, bought uh, by the uh, Sinwall uh, company. Um, they used it a little bit to gain experience, uh, to learn how a Formula One car looks like, Looks like so they, and also it has been um, uh, a technical manufacturer of uh, automotive parts. So they, they included their own products into this car. And that's why they called it uh, the Sinwall. They painted it in the British green. Um, they raced it, uh, I think, outside the official Formula One uh, championship. And as I mentioned, they uh, used it to gain experience because the big uh, T. Um, Goal was to win the championship, which they did later with their own car at the end of the 1950s. So the first, uh, the, and this was the first uh, British uh, Formula One champion. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see the uh, the Ferrari 375 on your screen as well, uh, if you're watching this yep. on YouTube. Yep, and uh, so... I'm not sure at which museum, but it is, I think, in one of the British museums where you can see this uh, car on display. Uh, up to, it is uh, still uh, drivable. And uh, if you're on YouTube, you see some of, uh, may, you may find some videos of this car in action. Yeah, results. But that, yes. Yes, results, and let's uh, come back to the Geoman uh, racing team. Uh, so Reg Panel as team chef, as team manager, not as a driver. 1961, they used the Cooper T53 uh, with two drivers, so quite professionally organi organized team. John Sotis, uh, Formula One champion later in 64, and at that time also a champion in, uh, I think, in various uh, motorcycle uh, championships so Absolutely. very talented uh, driver uh, he was able uh, to uh, gain four points and with this the 12th position in the championship uh, a little bit less known uh, Roy Salvadori uh, but also he he gained two points and with this could uh, qualify in the championship at the end on the 70th position so not too bad for a new uh, and a private team yeah, at least I scored two points. Most people don't ever score any <laughs> yes. points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I personally never scored any points in Formula One. <laughs> I mean, even the people who participated early on, right. you know, which we saw quite quite a few not having any teams that not, not scoring any points. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, just a little a short uh, note on on the company itself. Uh, as we saw, the, as, as we said before, Yemen credit were in financial working in financial services, and uh, the parental company was Bo Michael Limited. Yeah. So currently, it's uh, uh, basically a black horse company. Right? Exactly, Bromaka. It was founded, incorporated in 1926, so Geoman, Geoman's uh, parent company, and uh, dissolved not that long uh, time ago, 2014, and practically the business had been involved uh, into a company uh, called uh, Black Horse British Company, even if they have a black uh, prancing horse as a logo. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, again on the picture, if you're watching us on YouTube, you see the uh, basically the, the the main logo of of this comp of the Bowmaker company and uh, uh, the headquarters in Bournemouth, like what, what it looked like at the time. Yep. 
I'm uh, 62, second year for the team, and the last, uh, also the last year as Geoman uh, Racing. Uh, they continued with the same uh, drivers, John Sotis, uh, relatively uh, successful, well, not relatively, I would say uh, successful, uh, 19 points, which mean, uh, which meant fourth position in the, uh, in the championship. Uh, quite good uh, result for a small team. And uh, Roy Salvadori, uh, well, he unfortunately stayed with uh, two points and the 17th position. But John Sotis as the number one driver, and uh, we discussed this also uh, in other episodes, uh, we may assume a small team that the cars not had been 100% uh, on the same level. Because when you have the uh, number one driver, normally, if you have, if you don't know uh, who gets the new parts, then it's, it is, of course, the number one driver. If you're not sure who gets the stronger engine, it's the number one driver. So you may consider that the two cars not had been on the same level. Yes, that's right. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 I'd say that uh, Patrick, you probably to too politically correct you're saying not 100 percent the same but the probably was a huge discrepancy between the first and the second right. car in terms of yeah technical ability yeah most likely so yeah and this is the the promised photo of uh, uh, samantha turner uh, joseph samantha turner uh, and, uh, and and uh, the family Right, and uh, so they definitely invested a lot in, in Formula One and in racing and generally and eventually they even ended up founding uh, a racing team right? and uh, um, yeah, so, so um, after three years uh, of uh, trying to to make it work, uh, eventually they decided that it prob probably was enough. <laughs> And uh, yeah, they went back to financial services, but nevertheless, uh, for many, many years, they were great supporters of motorsport and racing, so they didn't quite quit the sport completely, so they were present in various ways and in various uh, sponsorships, and uh, yeah, I just want to, to mention that, that even though the team itself ceased to exist, uh, they were still present uh, as advocates of the sport and uh, participated in uh, many initiatives associated with Formula One. Yes, and, um, and maybe we, we can interpret it also that way that um, uh, Joseph Samengo Turner, the head of the family, uh, stopped uh, the, the budget, not only because uh, they may be wasting too much uh, on it, as uh, as we discussed in the beginning, because uh, they, of course, have been uh, motorsport fans, but also he may uh, see that his two sons would need to focus more time on the bank, on the on the on the business of the fam uh, of the on the family business, instead spending time on the racetracks inside the, the garage. So this uh, two. Uh, points together may came to this decision. Yeah, and I think it also kind of, uh, there is a cultural reason for that uh, because they were very successful in financial services. I think after three years, uh, uh, you are starting to see, normally you should start see, seeing the results. And I think that uh, it's just uh, on sort of the family uh, discussion, they decided that the results that they have achieved were not enough to continue and they decided to basically uh, end uh, the, the the team uh, at that stage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, same decisions as uh, today. Um, nevertheless, uh, Reg Panel uh, Racing, they uh, continued until 1965. Uh, uh, for example, we see here the in 63, they uh, used the Lotus NK4A and also in parallel the Lotus 24. Uh, drivers had been uh, Chris Emmon, another name we know from the Ferrari team, but also Maurice Trichinon, Luis Bianchi, Marston Gregory, Mike Halewood, John Campbell Jones, Roger Watt, and uh, Hep Sharp. Next year, they uh, used the Lotus 24 and also the newer 25. Again, with uh, Chris Emmon, 
Mike Hellwood and uh, Peter Refson. And in the last year, uh, Lotus 25 and the newest 33. And here we have uh, Tony Max, Richard Altwood, Mike Hellwood again. Uh, Innes Ireland, Chris Emmon, both also drive the, uh, temporary for Ferrari and uh, Bob Bonin. So uh, again, we see over the years, for whatever reason, uh, they had quite good uh, relation um, to uh, the Ferrari team, even if they never uh, uh, used uh, Ferrari cars. Um, yeah, late 1960s, see, yes. finally, when other, other teams uh, started to get sponsorships. Exactly. And uh, this has been now the, uh, the really the final years uh, of the team. Uh, and uh, and uh, the first time they also uh, used uh, Ferrari uh, besides the Lotus. So they included a Ferrari 246 and uh, Giancarlo Baghetti. Uh, also, Ferrari, uh, young uh, Ferrari uh, driver coming, uh, I think, from their, uh, their um, talent uh, school, or not wasn't a school, but it was somebody Ferrari had uh, the eye on as a young, talented driver. Also, uh, he was at some uh, quite successful races for uh, Ferrari. And then uh, it continues 67 again with the Lotus uh, and also British uh, BIM, uh, British racing team. Uh, the, and then they continued practically with uh, BIM, uh, Piers Courage. And again, they had been quite successful with uh, Pedro Rodriguez, uh, who was a very talented uh, driver and really uh, could uh, achieve the maximum with the BIM, which... Besides this, was not uh, always on a competitive level with uh, the other cast at that time. That's right. Again, I just want to remind our viewers that we do have a special on Rodriguez Brothers. And uh, you can, if you want to find out more about uh, Pedro Rodriguez, that's, uh, uh, that's why we would encourage you to go to, to our discussion about uh, Rodriguez Brothers. Exactly. And... Uh, at the end, uh, a quite a fun story. I mean, when you when we start doing an investigation, uh, especially as it's uh, about a smaller team as uh, Geoman uh, Racing, uh, you do, you don't always know uh, what you will find. So this was something quite uh, surprising. Uh, yeah, we had all sorts uh, of stories, like kidnappings. Uh, remember with Wonderwell and all sorts. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Exactly. So really, it's quite fun uh, doing the, um, the investigations for the various teams. So, uh, so what happened? Now we are in the year 2005. Uh, and here, um, what we found in the newspaper, in an article, the finance boss, Nicolas Samengo Turner, I assume a grandson, uh, at that time, he was 50 years old and working uh, and uh, coming from Hundon Suffolk was arrested in London on the way to a Formula One racing uh, team takeover meeting. He said uh, he, he, um, they confis confis well, no, sorry, sorry uh, he said he confiscated the Batson from his children and forgot about it uh, in the car. Uh, he was, uh, so he has been inside a police, uh, stopped, uh, stopped him and for whatever reason, they saw maybe inside the car that this Peyton was lying inside, which was a deviation to the uh, uh, regulations uh, in the well, UK. Well, it, uh, it, it is a weapon, so yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't be <laughs> Sorry, I'm here in the with, US. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you, you, you know, in the UK, even police, uh, not all police has guns. Exactly. <laughs> we, have, we have to ma make that distinction between US and UK. So, yeah. So, exactly. So, 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 definitely, if you are uh, uh, just a you know, regular uh, citizen, you shouldn't be running around with uh, weapons like batons in your, yes. uh, in your car. Uh, exactly. And uh, that's why. Uh, uh, he was ar arrested uh, temporary at, uh, and couldn't go to this uh, takeover meeting. Uh, during the three-day hearing at the court, uh, it was, to uh, was told he had been on his way to uh, clinch a deal to take over Eddie Jordan's Formula One uh, racing team, uh, which later fell through, unfortunately for him. 
uh, when he was stopped in a random search on the Victoria embankment. Uh, Jordan, and we will speak a lot about Jordan when we come uh, to the uh, early 2000s. Uh, the team was then uh, later sold to the Midland Group uh, for 60 million US dollar. Yeah, and of course, uh, there were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories around this case that, you know, it was uh, very strange timing for this baton to be found in the car right when, you know, Nicholas uh, Semenge Turner was uh, trying to purchase a uh, Formula One team. But nevertheless, I guess for the for Semenge Turner uh, family, yeah, they, they do not own currently a uh, uh, a uh, Formula One team, but nevertheless, like I said, they they remain very interested in the sport, and yeah. you can see that there is a recent, uh, even recent evidence of that in in this funny story. Yeah, and that's all, folks, about the Geoman Racing Team. Yeah, that's right. Again, um, we just want to remind you that we are on all media apart from YouTube. YouTube is our main channel, but you can find us on uh, all, all, all sorts of platforms. Uh, thanks to Patrick, who keeps track of all these things. And uh, we thank you for your attention. And as usual, let us know if you, we missed anything. We are always uh, uh, here to... to um, to receive your feedback and to make uh, some adjustments and even special episodes like today's episode. Thank you. Yep. That's right. <laughs>